Hello and welcome to Dialogue. As the U.S. and some of its close allies are calming things down with China, especially after the APEC summit in San Francisco, what about the EU bloc? How can we interpret the EU defining China as partner, competitor, and systemic rival at the same time? Is de-risking working for the bloc? And where exactly is China-EU relationship heading for? As the first China-EU summit in four years is to be held in Beijing soon, I'm very honored to have this exclusive interview with uh, Mr. Wu Hongbo, special representative of the Chinese government on European affairs. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Welcome to Dialogue, uh, Mr. Ambassador. You know, this year marks the 20th anniversary of the China-EU uh, relationship, that's the establishment of this uh, comprehensive strategic partnership between the two sides. I wonder how do you see, how do you evaluate uh, the relationship over the past two decades? Well, this is a very good question. As it was officially announced that the two presidents of the European Union are coming to China for an official visit. It is first time in four years, as you mentioned. And looking back the two decades of relations between China and European Union, and we will see a great progress has been made by the two sides. For instance, let's talk about uh, trade. This is a matter of uh, concern for many people. The total volume of China-EU trade uh, increased by close to nine times over the past two decades. And to have to be specific, that is, um, let me say this, is 1.5 million euros worth of goods is traded every minute. Every minute. Every minute between China and European Union. And the European Union has increased their investment in China almost by three times. And on Chinese side, we started with investing nothing. Now, the total volume of investment in European Union countries uh, amounted to $100 billion US. That's a great um, figure. And let's talk about connectivity. We are two continents connected. However, the connectivity was not that de desirable. However, with the Belt and Road Initiative, um, we could see every year there are as many as 10,000 freight trains to and from China and European Union countries. We are reaching more than 200 countries in 25 countries in Europe. So in short, I would like to say over the past 20 years, under the concept of a comprehensive strategic partnership, China and European Union has been working together and we achieve tangible results for both sides. At the same time, we are willing to, let's say, and deepen our understanding and to find the practical way of uh, cooperation, at the same time, manage our differences. Basically, I think in the past two years, uh, 20 years, both China and the European Union have been working towards the maintenance of world peace and development. So we are satisfied with the status quo, and of course there are further rooms for improvement. Mm -hmm. Well, critically important relationship, uh, and of course, as you said, with further improvement. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you mentioned the status quo. We do see in the recent couple of years, let's say, uh, the EU side has uh, you know, redefined or whatever, you know, they define China as a partner, a competitor, and a systemic rival. In September, you said that you know, such a definition confuses the Chinese side, as well as probably some politicians and business people and public inside the EU. Mm -hmm. you know, there's kind of uncertainty because people are 
I'm not sure, you know, what, are, what kind of relationship will we have between the two sides. Uh, so could you talk more about that? Well, this is very interesting. I've been talking um, with the European friends when I traveled to Europe. And in the past two decades, basically our relations has been guided by comprehensive strategic partnership. But in recent years, there's a new idea on the um, European Union side. That is, as you said, the partnership, uh, the partner, competitor, and the systemic rival. This is really confusing. And I've been talking to many uh, European friends. I said, you and I, both drivers, when we drive a car to a crossroad, then you are expecting a one light, either red, green, or yellow. But now we, we have a strange situation. You have three lights on at the same time. Perhaps green as a, a partner, and the yellow as competitor, and red, like the systemic rival. So not Chinese are being confused whether we're going to drive forward or backward or stop there forever. Even the European friends are confused themselves. Who is going to make decision? Whether you're a rival, you're a competitor, or you're a partner. Now, recent example that uh, some EU companies they wish to invest in China because they believe China is a partner. But the, some EU mem member states, governments, they believe they should look at this investment from different angle, that is competitors or a rival. So you will see even the European Union people within their country, they are pulling to different directions. Let me say this, if we have a different social system with the European Union and we become rivals, then actually this is a status quo 20 years ago. Why the European partners did not say, then you are a systemic rival, why now? And this is really harmful because either the competitor or systemic arrival would be harmful to our cooperation, to our dialogue, communication between the two sides. So I do hope that the European Union friends and the governments would stick to the original definition of our relations, that is comprehensive strategic partnership. Uh, earlier this year, the European uh, Commission President uh, Ursula uh, von uh, der Leyen you know, announced the investigation into the Chinese EVs to see if there is a subsidy behind uh, the rise of uh, let's say, export to the European Union countries. Um, you know, some say this is um, uh, you know, like a protectionist practice, um, probably should not resort to. But anyway, what kind of effects that it will have probably will have on relationship between China and the European Union. Uh, does that, you know, have anything to do with this kind of con definition, you know, competitor or rival here? Well, let's talk about the anti-subsidy investigation first. It has not been supported by evidence. It has received no prior complaints from the business. And it is not consistent with the WTO rules and, the, and even EU laws. Having said all that, people say this investigation is not out of a business consideration, but the political consideration. And I would agree, and they have a point in what say. Now, talking about uh, the investigation, Let's look at the fact. In China, in Europe, automobile industry is highly modernized 
and also globalized. Take China and Germany, for example. Last year, 2022, on the Chinese market, the German companies took 21% of the share. At the same time, the Chinese companies took only 8% on the European market. That is the fact. And also, the EVs, electric uh, vehicles, export to European Union, actually are produced in Chinese companies financed by Americans or European unions. Now, having said all that, just imagine if a trade war is launched, who will be hurt more seriously? This is really obvious. This is not a scenario we would like to see. What we would like to see is that both China and the European Union work together for the green economy and for energy transition. EV industry is one of the examples we can cooperate. Now, come back to your question about the investigation. We see that investigation is sheer fabrication, is sheer protectionism. The Chinese enterprises have all the reasons to be dissatisfied and to be very unhappy. Well, uh, speak of that, you know, along that line, I would say uh, the EU side, especially the European Commission, they have, uh, you know, basically uh, <clears throat> mapped out the policy on China. They call it de-risking mm -hmm. you know, to reduce uh, so-called over-dependency on the Chinese side, to reduce their vulnerability. Uh, is there a point in such a, you know, remarks, a statement, a policy? You know, what's your view on that? De-risking is the invention of the European Union. Decoupling is the invention of the United States of America. It seems nowadays de-risking is more popular. But the question is, what is the definition of a risk? What is the boundaries? Let me ask, ask to say this question. Uh, I, I would like to make this point. Um, according to the European Union, they heavily depend on 121 kinds of pro products from China. However, not all of 121 products need to take action. Their conclusion is that the government intervention is needed only for 34 kinds of Chinese products. But as far as we are concerned, China heavily depends on the European Union supply of more than 200 products. So you have to narrow down the areas for de-risking. Now, the question is, we are afraid that the idea of de-risking has been overstretched politicized or weaponized. I give you an example. Huawei is being accused a potential threat to national security. That's a serious charge. But so far, not a single country standing out saying, we have hard evidence. You are the threat to my national security. And also, the Chinese company Huawei stepped forward saying, we are willing to enter into no backdoor agreement with any government. I wouldn't think the American companies would do the same. But sadly enough, no country responded to that offer. But even then, you are still the risk to our national security. What I say is the political witch hunt. Mm -hmm. The point I'm trying to make is the risking 
should not be weaponized, should not be politicized. Otherwise, our bilateral relations, our bilateral trades will be seriously hurt and affected. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that this uh, China-EU summit, as we said, uh, you know, first one in four years, they are going to be held in Beijing. So what will be on the agenda and what's the expectation of the Chinese side? Um, this is a very uh, important uh, moment for both China and European Union because this is the um, European Union leaders to meet the Chinese new government formally. And secondly, it's the first time in four years since the pandemic that the top leaders of two sides sit down, have a very serious discussions about bilateral relations. And thirdly, this is an important occasion. We are marking the 20th anniversary of the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. So what I expect the meetings uh, to do, I would say it's time to sit down to review the past and look forward to the future. And I do hope that they will come out after meeting with the guiding principles for our relations in the future. Um, as far as we are concerned, European Union and China are two major world forces representing two major civilizations. And although we have differences, but we are important forces for world development and the stability. So good relations between China and the European Union not only benefit China and Europe, European Union countries, but also benefit and conducive to the world peace and development. And I do hope after the meeting, the both sides will send positive signal to the interna international community. The two major economies will work together to help the world economic recovery, to stabilize the complex situation, and work towards the common prosperity. You know, speaker for the China-EU relationship, well, you have to somehow mention the United States as an external factor, but mm -hmm. it's uh, playing a role, let's say. You know, most Chinese um, experts would say that's a negative role, unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, in terms of China-EU relationship. Um, you, earlier you mentioned about, uh, you know, probably, a, you know, a politicization of the risk and politicization of uh, uh, sometimes part of the relationship of there. Uh, I wonder what's your <coughs> view on that kind of, uh, uh, say, statement or idea somehow the EU is playing this, um, this negative role uh, in, in uh, European relationship with China? Well, uh, Sino-US relations, Sino-EU relations, and EU-US relations, they actually influence each other. Um, the European Union friends have been watching very closely the relations between China and the United States. Uh, when the Chinese uh, and the American presidents met together, have discussions, and they were very happy. And they said this is a good and a positive signal to the rest of the world. However, the relations between China and European Union did not start after the San Francisco conference. Exactly. Actually, uh, President Xi Jinping, as you, you can recall, met the four presidents before, had face-to-face -face discussions. And, uh, the new Prime Minister of China, Premier, Mr. Li Qiang, uh, made his first overseas uh, visit to Europe. And you could see the importance attached to European and China relations. And so far, there are eight a European Union commissioners uh, came one after another for, uh, for discussions in China. And in preparation of the uh, high-level meetings between the leaders, um, the high-level uh, dialogues on strategic uh, cooperation, 
on trade and economic relations, on green uh, economy, uh, green translation, uh, trans transition, and the digital cooperation already took place and had a very good discussions, good results. As far as the relations between China and European Union are concerned, we see that is purely bilateral relations. We do support the, United, the European Union to be autonomous strategically. Well, we do hope our relations would not be directed against any third party, nor our relations to be subject to the influence or manipulation of third party. You mentioned about this autonomy. You know, French President Macron made it uh, powerfully, you know, uh, calling for strategic autonomy for the European Union. No. Where are they now? Good question. I've been asking um, the European Union friends. Uh, I said, as far as we are concerned, we are supporting strong, united, prosperous Europe. We support European integration process. We support the Europe uh, strategic autonomy. I said to our friends, if you look around, China is the only major country that has been very consistent in the support of European Union uh, autonomous, uh, the strategic autonomy. Well, recently, uh, the Chinese side has uh, offered uh, this uh, free uh, visa entry for citizens from mm -hmm. you know, six countries, including five of them are from European, uh, you know, European members like uh, mm. France, Germany, Italy, right. uh, Spain, uh, the Netherlands. So what is the message here? I think there are several messages. Number one, I think that the world and us are emerging out from a pandemic. Um, there is a so-called deficit of people-to-people -people contact. We have been actually separated physically uh, from each other. Now, the air service are resuming. People start uh, visiting each other. So the facilities on the part of the government need to be provided. The Chinese government has been uh, readjusting the visa policies to cater the needs of uh, people from outside. Um, as far as the current uh, policy is concerned, of six countries which enjoy visa-free uh, policies, five are from Europe. So that shows the Chinese government attached great importance to the relations between China and European countries. However, this is only the first group of countries. I have a reason to expect there will be more uh, countries who will benefit from visa-free policies in the future. And at the same time, we do hope that um, European Union countries would provide the same convenience and facilities to the Chinese visitors. Well, that would be bringing the relationship uh, I mean, even closer uh, from right. both sides, right. especially right. among the peoples there. Right. Ambassador, in, in recent days, you know, we do see uh, leaders and politicians from both the EU and the US. Uh, they have been visiting Ukraine to mark the 10th anniversary of the Euromaidan uh, protests in uh, mm -hmm. Ukraine, Kiev. Uh, apart from expressing support to the Ukrainians, uh, uh, the conflicts with, uh, with Russia, they also talked about, uh, you know, to somehow get China involved, you know, describing the Ukraine crisis as one of ideological struggle between the East and the West. And, uh, you know, some would go even further, uh, probably beyond that. So what do you make of that? We have been explaining to the European counterparts the Chinese position on the Ukraine crisis. We are always on the side of peace. And we are both the friends of Ukraine uh, and Russia. And we hope that the, the conflict could end as early as possible. So no more blood would be shared. 
the best way of end the conflict is to find a peacefully a peace negotiated uh, through diplomatic channel the negotiated settlement to the conflict and we at the beginning for quite some time saying to the European Union uh, that military sanctions or military interventions or sanctions wouldn't work. They wouldn't believe us. It seems uh, the <laughs> sanctions did not work at all. And the military uh, supplies only added the fuel to the fire. And even the United States and some European countries feel exhausted in their support in the military uh, supply or in the, uh, the sanctions against uh, Russia. So again, this background, they came to us saying, you are the only one that could convey and convince President Putin to stop the, 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 the conflict. I say, my goodness, you are actually uh, overrated our importance. And we are doing what we should do. We never give up our efforts. We are working for peaceful settlement of the conflict. And don't overestimate our influence on Russia. Russia is independent uh, sovereign state. And we're also saying that the issue should be handled with care. And if you are continue to push forward, um, there is no a way for the other to maneuver. Then you, just like you drive somebody to the corner, and that will be very difficult for two sides to sit down. One important issue I, I raise to them is that so far, the European framework for security all failed. The reason is some countries or group fund countries, they want absolute security for themselves which means others have been left out will have absolutely unsafe. So if that is the balance, those feel absolutely absolute unsafe will come back to you. So the future arrangement should include each and everyone on the European continent. You have one security umbrella covering each and every, including Russia. We need a comprehensive, sustainable, and effective arrangements. That's the arrangement put forward by my president. That is a global security initiative. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Thank you for speaking with us. With that, we are coming to the end of today's discussion. Again, many thanks to Ambassador Wu. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.